Hey everyone on Facebook, my name is Will Potter. I'm an investigative journalist and a TED Senior Fellow. And I'm here in Banff, Canada with Chris Segoyan at TED. Chris is uh, the chief technologist at the American Civil Liberties Union. He's an expert on privacy and surveillance. And we're gonna talk to th today just a little bit about what we all can do to protect our information. And Chris, you gave a talk earlier today that was very well received about exactly that, what we all should be doing in light of increasing surveillance, a lack of privacy. But before we get started, I think there is often a question of, well, you know, why does this privacy even matter anymore? Does privacy even exist anymore? How do we protect our privacy? Uh, or excuse me, I should say, uh, if I don't have anything to hide, why should I be concerned about this? Yeah, so I hear this all the time from people. And, you know, I think many of us do have something to hide. Uh, we may not all be worried about the government, but there are things that we would, may not want our employers to know or members of our families. You know, we have curtains in front of our windows. We wear clothes. We, you know, get prescription medication that we don't want people to know about. And, you know, we, we have these components to our lives that we don't reveal to everyone that we know. You know, children may not be upset or, you know, children may not be worried about the government, but they may not, not want the principal at their school to know, you know, what they're interested in or who they're talking to. You know, we have, uh, we have a relationship with the concept of privacy that is more nuanced than just, do I care about my privacy or not? It's who am I worried about? Who am I trying to protect my information from? Yes, every once in a while you find someone who's, who lives their life a complete open book, who has truly no secrets, but there are plenty of other people who do have things to hide and, you know, we shouldn't flush privacy down the toilet because a few people uh, you know, are, are privileged enough to have nothing to worry about. Well, and I should have noted earlier also that if you're watching this live on Facebook right now, you can ask questions just by typing a comment. Um, we have people here monitoring that. We'll be able to see your question and get it straight to Chris. Um, so ask some of those questions. And in the meantime, for me as a journalist, as a citizen, as just someone who's concerned about these issues and for our viewers, what would be kind of your top few things that we should all be doing uh, to protect our basic information. Right, so I think the first, the first part of this is you have to say, well, what are you trying to protect yourself from? Are you protecting yourself from the government? Are you protecting yourself from companies that might be trying to collect information about you? Are you trying to protect yourself from you know, uh, a stalker or an abusive ex-boyfriend? So you, the first thing is really to figure out who you're most worried about. Uh, there are sort of general tips that I, I would you know, recommend for, for everyone. So the most basic one and, and the tip that is really uh, the best bang for buck when it comes to privacy is putting a sticker or a Band-Aid over your webcam. Uh, you know, when I first started... You're talking about on your laptop or... On, on your laptop, the camera that faces you. Uh, when I first started really researching uh, privacy and surveillance, I was shocked to learn uh, the capabilities of... Uh, the, the many software tools that people can buy online, sort of $29.99 spy on your ex-girlfriend software that you can install wow. surreptitiously on someone's computer. So there are hackers out there, there are criminals, uh, there are law enforcement and intelligence agencies both in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, and the ease with which someone can take over your webcam, uh, turn on the camera and have it surreptitiously collect video footage, even without the light on the camera turning on, it's really staggering. and. You know, I, while I, I hope that one day we will have computers that are secure enough that they can protect us from that, you know, when you put a sticker or a Band-Aid over the camera, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Now, you're, you're not trusting the security of your operating system or the security of your computer. You're trusting the fact that there's something physical between, between the lens and, and you. Uh, you know, go, going back to your previous question, well, you know, I have nothing to hide. You know, I'm never naked in front of my camera. Well, you know, other people may be, and so if you, you know, are sending your college-age kids uh, off to school or you have teenagers uh, who have computers in their rooms, you don't know what's, be what's happening uh, be behind closed doors. And the safest and smartest thing that you can do is to put a sticker on their webcam too. You know, and when you're saying that about kind of the ex-girlfriend software, it immediately makes me think that some populations are going to be disproportionately vulnerable. In that case, women, obviously. But in your talk, you discussed a little bit more about how the encryption tools that are built into certain devices already are disproportionately favoring 
privileged populations over others. I mean, can you explain a little bit more about what that means and, and kind of the, the repercussions that that has as well? Sure. So the short version of, of what I said in, in my TED talk today w was really that um, Apple has spent a lot of time and money to build security features into its mobile products. So the iPhone, the iPad, um, those devices encrypt data by default, which means that if you have uh, a password on your device and it's and someone tries to get into it, they're going to have a really difficult time, whether that someone is an employer, uh, if it's not an employer-provided device, whether that is you know uh, your your partner or whether that is um, you know a government agency, uh, Apple devices are really, really secure. Uh, separately, Apple devices automatically encrypt text messages f sent by one person with an iPhone to another person with an iPhone, which means if the police are investigating you and they go to Verizon or AT&T and they say, hey, you know, last week Will and Chris exchanged some messages, can we get a copy of them? AT&T or Verizon will say, sorry, we don't have them. They're, they are transmitted in a way that the phone companies cannot read them. You know, for Apple's customers, this is a great, great thing. Uh, but uh, Apple devices are expensive. You know, there are $600 phones, and not everyone can afford to spend 600 bucks on a smartphone. Google really is killing it at the middle and low end of the smartphone market, selling you know, $50, $100 Android phones. And unfortunately, the security of, of, of Android is really lacking in comparison. You know, in, in my talk, I, I frame this not just as a privacy issue or a cybersecurity issue, but it's really an issue of equality and racial justice because if the poor and, and vulnerable in our societies are using devices that do nothing to protect them from surveillance and the rich and powerful are using devices that leave them completely, uh, sorry, the rich and powerful are using devices that make them essentially off limits to, to the government, right. uh, that creates a system uh, uh, of surveillance inequality and further perpetuates the existing problems of inequality that we have in our society. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question from Facebook, and just as a reminder, if anyone else has questions, you can just type them in, and we'll be able to ask Chris directly here in Banff at, TED, at the TED Summit. This one's from Danny Diaz. He asks, would you suggest placing a sticker over the mic as well, or I assume doing some other means to protect the audio content? Yeah. So that, that's a great question, and certainly uh, there is spying software that is both commercially available and used by governments that can uh, remotely enable the microphone either in a smartphone or in a laptop when it's not being used. Uh, the problem uh, with the sticker approach, uh, as the public, uh, as sort of the tech news sites covered last week when it was revealed that Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has a sticker over both his webcam and the microphone port on his laptop, is that the sticker over the microphone doesn't actually work that well. Hmm. Uh, and so, uh, the folks that I know who are truly paranoid, uh, what they do is either put uh, hot glue in the, Microsoft, in, the, uh, in the microphone port or they will actually open up their laptop and cut the wire. Um, now, you know, I'm, I'm not going to uh, recommend uh, invasive laptop surgery for the layperson. Certainly, uh, that could uh, violate your warranty, but um, it's really hard to protect the microphone on your device. and. You know, I said before that the, the, the light on your webcam isn't reliable, but you at least have this like, easy thing you can do with the sticker. There's no easy sticker thing, something like a sticker that you can do for the microphone. And so, you know, what I really recommend for people is if you're worried about sensitive conversations being picked up with a, a hacked microphone, you know, the best thing to do is to leave that phone uh, out of your bedroom. Uh, if you're having a private conversation in your office, you know, leave the phone outside. Um, you know, maybe you don't need to take that phone into the bathroom. Uh, there are places that maybe we shouldn't have microphones. Well, so then it immediately starts going down a, a logical progression that I think to some people, like you said, be can become paranoia. And I think Emily, with our next Facebook comment here, really touches on that by asking, how likely is it that I'm actually being watched if I'm just a regular person going about my life? Yeah, so uh, as I sort of described before, the first thing you really need to, to think about is by whom? Who am I worried about? So if you're a regular person, uh, 
depending on you know where you live, what your socioeconomic status is, and what your race is, maybe you're more or less worried about the police. You know, there are plenty of law-abiding uh, African American and Latino Americans who have good reason to be worried about the police, even though they're just regular tax-paying, law-abiding individuals. Um, if if the police are not your concern, then maybe you're worried about your employer watching what you're doing or what you're saying. Maybe you're worried about advertisers who are tracking you as you go on the on the web, and so you know you visit a. a, a a page on WebMD because you're worried about some potential disease you might have, and then two weeks later you're seeing a pop-up advertisement for you know diabetes medication. So that's you know there's a concern about tracking online. Maybe you know you had a stalker uh, in the past, someone who was harassing you either in person or over the internet, and you're now worried this person may be furthering uh, that stalking th through technology. The first step is really who is out there that I'm worried about, and then what can I do to limit their access to my information? And, you know, I feel older and older uh, talking about technology, and Boris from Facebook has an interesting question about when we're talking about young people, when it's, the technology is just ubiquitous. Um, younger and younger people you see on the streets have iPhones and Androids, and it's just built into everyday life. And Boris is asking, what is the best you have, advice you have, Chris, for youth and children facing dangers online in today's world of digital, uh, excuse me, of digital overtake of teenage life? So uh, I am not a teenager anymore, uh, and I haven't been a teenager in, in a while. I don't know what it's like to be a teenager in this modern world, but I have to imagine it's, it's truly terrifying. You know, a, a question I think is related to what Boris asked is, is, you know, one thing that I hear over and over again when I, I talk to adults is this feeling like young people don't care about privacy. You know, I, what I hear is like, oh, these kids today, they're posting all this stuff to social media. You know, they don't care about privacy. They're, you know, this is awful. Uh, and that's actually not true. So there's some really amazing research that's been done by, by academic experts. The, the sort of one of the most uh, well-known is a woman named Dana Boyd, and she has a book about how teenagers use technology and how teenagers view privacy. It's called It's Complicated. Um, and Dana's sort of big insight is that, yes, teenagers are not concerned about the FBI or the NSA, but they are concerned about their teachers, their principals, and their parents. Uh, and teenagers are so good at protecting their privacy. They're so good at hiding sensitive information from their teachers and their parents that the adults think they're not taking any actions at all. Oh, they're sure. basically hiding in plain sight. Right. So, you know, if you are a parent uh, and you have kids and you're worried that your kids are, you know, sharing more information online than, than you think they should be, uh, you know, I think you'll be surprised at how tech savvy and privacy savvy m many kids are. And I think, you know, the, the massive popularity of services like Snapchat, which delete messages after a very short period of time, demonstrates that, you know, kids inherently get uh, the, the harm that comes from the long-term retention of data. You know, we've all been idiotic children at one point and some of us were some of us some of us have done idiotic things l later in our lives too uh, you know when technology captures that and saves it forever we we can be haunted by these these stupid right. things that we do and you know I, I think kids using services like snapchat uh, I think those kids are super smart because they shouldn't be haunted for the rest of their lives because of something they say or do when they're 16. I see that on my work all the time. I think we just radically underestimate kids in general and teenagers and how aware they are of these issues and how much they care. Um, and particularly about this next question we have from Shagun Kanwar. Uh, how heavily are social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter used for surveillance by governments and organizations? Which is something I hear about um, from young people all the time, expecting this to be kind of ubiquitous again, or that uh, everything is up for grabs, especially political speech. Um, so can you comment on that? Yeah, that's a really stellar question. Uh, I think there are sort of two types of surveillance of social media that we should be thinking about. One is surveillance of private communications, uh, and one is surveillance of, of what you might call public communications. Okay. So if you have a public Twitter profile and anyone can follow you, uh, there are still gonna be um, 
companies and governments that are going to want to see that information. And you know, there are so many people tweeting every day that it's actually difficult for these large organizations to, to focus on individual things. And so what we've seen is that Twitter, uh, well, tw Twitter has had a, a very difficult time making money. Uh, and one of the ways that Twitter makes money is by selling access to what's called the fire hose, which is they basically sell bulk access to every tweet. And then there are these analytics companies who come in and mine the tweet stream uh, and, uh, and sell data to uh, companies and governments that want it. And you know, there, are, there are companies that say, you know, we can predict social uprisings, we can predict uh, major world-changing events before you know, CNN has even reported it. Uh, and, and we know that a bunch of uh, companies are subscribing to this. And, and uh, just a few months ago, Twitter announced that they were sort of kicking the CIA uh, away as a customer from one of these firms. They said, mm. we're no longer going to sell this to the CIA. But DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, is still a subscriber. So that's the sort of public, the public, the public surveillance. Then, you know, if you are, have marked your, your account private or you're sharing information just with, with certain friends, uh, all of the tech companies routinely receive demands for private user data from government agencies in the U.S., state, federal, local, and abroad. And uh, you know, to their credit, Facebook, uh, Google, Twitter, all of these big tech companies publish an annual transparency report revealing how many requests they've received. And they even break it down uh, by country so you can see uh, you know, I'm not blaming the companies for this. In, in many ways, if they have data, they're required to turn it over to governments when those governments f uh, satisfy legal requirements. But what is clear from these transparency reports is that governments in the US and elsewhere have an enormous appetite uh, for, for data. The last thing I'll, I'll also add is that there is an extremely common practice, particularly in schools, for police officers who are posted in those schools to create fake Facebook accounts, right. friends, students, in order to try and learn what's going on. Uh, you know, they're not submitting a court order and demanding data from Facebook. They're tricking the students into Large sharing the data. Law been using this against political activists as well, increasingly. For sure. And, and there, you know, there are a number of, of Black Lives Matter activists and other groups who are worried, Tea Party groups who are worried that they are being uh, surveilled. Um, you know, it's really hard when you're uh, organizing a social movement that anyone can join. You know, how do you know if the person who's seeking to join is truly, uh, uh, you know, an interested individual who wants to change the world, or an undercover law enforcement agent? Right. How do you be inclusive while also being safe? Um, it kind of ties into our next question we have from someone on Facebook. Uh, Aroni Roy asks, "Is there any software or apps that might be useful in tackling or detecting unwanted surveillance?" I think it circles back to kind of your, um, which you had originally as an article on ideas. Uh, TED Ideas platform about the top tips everyone should be yeah. using to protect their information. But could you elaborate on that a little bit? Are there, is there any software that people yeah, should care it, about? Yeah, it's actually really hard. And, and, you know, one of the most sort of interesting things for, for me is that the best practices for security that are followed by experts are so different than the best practices followed by lay people. Right. Uh, so, you know, none of the experts that I know, myself included, none of us use antivirus software. We think of antivirus software essentially as a scam that's designed to take money from consumers who don't know any better, but it doesn't do anything to protect you. Mm. Whereas if you ask, I think, the average person, what should they do to protect themselves from viruses, the first thing they'll say is antivirus. Okay. So experts don't use antivirus software. Um, you know, you ask a regular person, what kind of password should you have? You know, how would you make a good or a bad password? The layperson would say, oh, I'm supposed to have you know, uppercase and lowercase and numbers and special symbols. The expert says you should have a bunch of words. They can all be lowercase, but you know, have a password that's three or four words long. The words should have nothing to do with each other. It shouldn't be you know, lyrics from a song, but it should be easy to type and easy to remember. Which is something we never hear. And even on a lot of websites now, they prompt you and say you have to have X number of numbers and characters and whatever. And that's super infuriating. And, and not only do experts recommend these sort of long pass phrases instead of passwords, um, but you know we live in a world now where there are data breaches, companies getting hacked. It seems like every week. And if you are s using the same password to access multiple websites, it's only a matter of time before one of your passwords gets hacked. And so 
there's no way for a human being to remember 50 different unique passwords. It's not possible. Our, our brains don't work that way. And so experts recommend the use of tools like password managers, right. where you install the tool, it creates random long passwords for every website you visit, and then it enters them automatically into the sites that you visit. So you don't have to remember any of that stuff. You just need the one pass phrase for the password manager. There are several that are out there, LastPass, one password, one password yeah. uh, key pass, there are a few. I don't really care which one you use, but if you are using the same password across multiple websites, or you think you're being smart because you have like a password and then you add some numbers or you added some specific words, like your system isn't smart enough to defeat the hackers, use a password manager. Well, when I was surprised, I started using a password manager a couple of years ago for security reasons, and then realized it saved me a lot of time also. It's kind of counterintuitive because you can just remember that one and you can autofill and not getting too nerdy about uh, hacks to save time and all that stuff because we have another question from Facebook from John. So if you do all this stuff or if you don't and you're ignoring everything Chris is saying and something happens or if you do get hacked or lose your information, what are the steps then that you should take? You know, it's really hard to recover after a hack. Uh, our system of laws in the U.S. and in many other countries is, is really built around data breaches that in, in which financial information is stolen, right? So you can put a fraud alert on your credit file. You can ask your banks to send you new credit card numbers. And in many cases, the banks will know that your card was hacked before you will. But that in many ways is a system that is built around the kinds of hacks that we had two or three years ago, where it was just financial information that was being stolen. Today, where you have uh, you know, medical information, uh, forums like Ashley Madison, a, a, a dating website for people who were uh, engaging in non-traditional relationships and in many cases outside of, of marriage, um, you know, if that information is stolen, if you have a, a, a website for people with some kind of sensitive medical condition, you know, you can get a new credit card number, you can even get a new social security number, but you cannot, you know, establish an entirely new life. And if the first Google result for your name is that sensitive medical result from a test that, that got hacked, you're toast. Uh, if you have photographs of yourself without clothing that are hacked and put online and the first Google result for your name is a nude photo of you, you know, that's going to haunt you for the rest of your life. Every future job interview, your employer is going to type your name in and see this information. We don't really have uh, a way to deal with breaches, with hacks of non-financial information. And in many ways, the financial ones are the easiest to deal with. You know, it's a pain in the butt. You get some new cards. But you know, in, in all countries around the world now, it seems like hospitals and doctors are moving towards electronic health records. And it's terrifying because, you know, I, I've, I've sat, sat in a doctor's office and, you know, I've been in the situation where I'm filling out the intake form and they're asking about your medical history and I'm thinking, do I want to disclose this information to this doctor? Normally, you know, I want my doctor to know everything possible so they can help me. And I'm asking myself, do I want to tell this to the doctor because I'm worried that at some point, two years or five years or 10 years down the line, that doctor is going to get hacked right. and all my stuff's going to be online. You know, and this next question from Gavin, I think touches on that. And then some of your comments earlier, especially about young people. But Gavin from Facebook asks, do you have any tips on removing data that's out in the wild? Which makes me think of everything from, you know, leaked celebrity nude or hacked celebrity nudes to, um, a political activist saying a hyperbolic Twitter post or a Facebook post that then someone regrets and wants to take down uh, to anything. Um, <laughs> once that's out there, uh, can anything be done about it? I mean, yeah, it's it's really hard. I mean, you know, tweets are now even archived by the Library of Congress, so those things are going to be there forever. Uh, you know, m I get this question a lot from people um, and. You know, whether it's uh, people who have been, um, who regret something they've said or victims of revenge porn, for example. Uh, 
you know, if it's, a, if it's revenge porn, many of the tech companies, Google and others, will voluntarily remove it if you, if you contact them. But if it's just something that you regret doing or, or something that's been hacked that, that is not in, in, the, in the sexual imagery uh, category, you know, your best bet is really to try and post new stuff and hope that that can float to the top. Right? So uh, websites have something that, that experts sort of call Google juice. So uh, websites like Wikipedia, uh, Pinterest, um, Facebook, they float to the top of Google results. Right? It's difficult to make sure that something unpleasant vanishes from the internet, but if you can bury it from the front page, you know, a future employer might not look past the first five or 10 or 20 Google results. And so, you know, if you're worried about that one article from when you were in high school surfacing on your Google results, and you have a unique enough name that, you know, it, when someone searches for that name, it's just you, I would recommend, you know, signing up for a bunch of different social media accounts. You don't have to use them, but just sign up so that you know you have a Facebook page in your Google results, you have a Pinterest page, you have a Twitter page, and hope that that buries all the old stuff. Well, and it sounds like also fundamentally having this ground level education about privacy, technology, and how to be smarter from the start so we're not having to deal with stuff like that, right? Yeah, I mean, I think in the same way that I think it would be great if we taught financial literacy to, to young people in schools, I think it would be great if we taught more advanced, or if we taught digital security and privacy. I, I, as I said before, I think kids figure out privacy, but you know, it, they, they don't always get all the details right. And I think the threats that are out there are so real um, that, that everyone would be helped by learning a little bit more about privacy and security. So, especially in the last few years, or more than the last few years, we've seen the rise of a lot of open source technologies. And our next question from Facebook from Botter asks, uh, will we be more safe if we use things like Linux or open software like Mozilla, um, things that have this kind of crowdsourced or crowd input on the technology uh, comparatively from both a security and just a developmental standpoint? Is that safer or more protective than other private operations? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to nerd out too much because uh, I, I'm aware of the fact that the average person watching this probably doesn't know too much about what the difference is between Linux and these other operating systems. I'll say that, you know, open source software, which is software where nerds can download and look at the code, um, is not always more secure. There's this, this phrase that, um, that essentially the more people who look at it, the easier it is to find the bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that hasn't actually shown to be true. Uh, flaws can hide in plain sight for long periods of time. Um, you know, in many cases, the, what affects the quality of the software, what affects the security of a tool, uh, is more about how many people are working on it. And so if you have one tool made by a volunteer, um, it may be less secure than a tool made by 50 people who are getting paid to do it full time. And um, you know, while the Firefox browser is probably more privacy preserving, it is actually less secure than Chrome. Um, and you know, I, I, th I think it's unfortunate that we have to choose between which browser is more secure and which browser is, is more private. We cannot have one that does both. And you know, Google is the largest advertising company in the world. It isn't going to be, or it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that the web browser given away for free by the largest advertising company in the world is not going to protect you from other advertising companies or companies including Google online. Chrome facilitates the mass delivery of your personal data to every, every advertiser when you, when you browse the web. I mean, it's, you leave a trail of data behind you when you browse with Chrome. At the same time, Chrome and the, the Chrome team do a great job of keeping you secure from hackers. And so you sort of have to pick your poison. Are you more worried about being hacked or are you more worried about online advertisers tracking what you're doing online? Well, and it seems as there's an increasing awareness about this issue in general. Some companies like Facebook have been forced to respond. And anybody who uses Facebook, like all of our viewers right now, you know you can choose between having certain po posts public or private. And I find it all a little bit confusing. I have hard to remember and go between the, all of those. But that's exactly our next question um, from one of the viewers is, when you set these security settings on social media, 
in order to only allow certain people to see what you've posted. Is that stuff still being recorded or monitored or open to surveillance, despite you trying to stop it from, you know, blasting out to the world? Yeah, so the privacy settings really only control the distribution of information through the platform. The privacy settings do not stop Facebook's ability to collect and retain data, and they don't stop Facebook's ability to turn over your data to the government if the government asks for it. Uh, separately, I think many people think that Facebook is only watching what they're doing when they're on Facebook. That is a, a huge misconception. Uh, everywhere you see a like button on the internet, Facebook is watching you. You should think of uh, the like button in many ways like a pair of eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, all these newspapers and blogs have like buttons so that you can like an article. That what that means is that Facebook has this view of what you're doing online. They know which articles you're reading. They know which videos you're watching. They know which content you're, you're looking at online. And so they can pull this information uh, and then you know, monetize it and use it to deliver ads to people that the company thinks are more relevant. But what that means is that Facebook has truly unparalleled access to uh, information about the kinds of people we are, what makes us tick, what makes us happy, what makes us sad. Um, and that's information that they leverage for, for advertising purposes, but it's also information that governments or divorce lawyers could come and ask for really at, at any moment. And I think that's an excellent point to end on today, that these are tools we all need. These are tools we all want to use, whether it's for fun or for our work or for participating in a democracy, but we also need to be cautious about how we're doing that. So in that spirit, we want to thank you all for joining us today live from the TED Summit in Banff, Canada. I'm here with Chris Segoyan, who just gave a TED Talk. Uh, he has some other TED Talks available online, along with some articles about how to protect your privacy at TED Ideas. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter. And my name is Will Potter. I'm one of the TED Senior Fellows.